Right, thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Greg Bach. I'm the assistant head of the university school. And this is our third speaker in our Red Gen series. And I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Brooke Talbot, who is the executive director of Red Gen. She's just going to say a few words about Red Gen, and then uh, I'll introduce our speaker. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, well, I don't know, welcome you all here. Let you know that cookies over the table, please do not um, miss them. Um, so we partner with the University School to bring four national speakers um, to the community each year, and so we are really grateful for our partnership with the University School, so thank you, Greg. Um, Gretchen, we are a local nonprofit that advocates for youth mental health and wellness, and we've been around for about um, six and a half years, and we do that through our work with schools, through our work with faith communities, as well as um, what we call community outreach, which is the community at large. Um, we really focus on youth mental health and wellness from a prevention standpoint. So we really advocate for um, really looking at wellness and um, what our youth needs in order to be well, um, to launch well. In our high schools, when we look at the schools, um, often we have middle school and high school, we have regions to be chapters. So in a lot of our, we've got 15 middle schools and high schools in the area that have regions to be chapters. And in those um, schools, we have groups of students who gather, um, learn about wellness, and then they actually go within their school community and advocate for, new, for their own mental health and wellness within their school community. So um, that's just kind of one of the ways that we engage in the community. Um, but tonight, we're here to uh, bring you a speaker, again, just to kind of advocate and educate about different ways that we can support our youth. So thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Brooke. And we had some of those students from some of the schools that uh, Brooke was talking about here with us today. Um, Michael, Dr. Michael Thompson's been with us all afternoon. Started with the uh, upper school and high school students, some from the area the university school, talking about the college pressures. And then uh, spent some time with uh, middle school students, talking about best friends, worst enemies. And then spent time with uh, some of the university school teachers and some other teachers from the local area, talking about boys. And tonight we're here to talk about play, so we're going to, we're going to play for a little bit. So, uh, uh, but Dr. Uh, Dr. Thompson, Michael Thompson is a consultant, author, psychologist, husband, father, grandfather. I could I could go on. Uh, as a consultant, he's, he's worked uh, in more than 700 schools across the United States, as well as international schools in Central America, Europe, Africa, Asia. Been on many of the network TV shows, radio shows. Many school conferences, many states. We were just talking before guests. He's been to 48 of 50 states um, in schools. Guess which two he has not been to? Alaska and Hawaii. No, they're, they're close. They have, they're, one of the names is the same. Two, two states we're thinking of. They don't have a lot of independent schools. Yeah, I don't have schools. There's a north and a south with it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got it? Oh, South Dakota. North and South Dakota. Um, <laughs> as, a, as an author, how many books is it? Seven books? Nine books. Nine books. Yeah. Nine books. Some of you have probably heard of The Pressured Child, Best Friends, Worst Enemies, Homesick and Happy, uh, three books about boys, Raising Kings, Speaking of Boys, It's a, uh, it's a Boy. Um, as, uh, but he spent much of his career as a psychologist, specializing in children and families. He is the supervising psychologist for the Belmont Hill School, which is an independent school for boys in grades 7 to 12. Dr. Thompson is married to Dr. Teresa McNally, a psychotherapist, and is the father of two grown children and the grandfather of two granddaughters and a three-year-old three -year -old grandson. 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 Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thompson University. I want to thank Greg. He's been my shepherd all day. Um, I've got some free advice too. I've got the therapy. He's been, he's been looking after me. At one point, I was walking out of the auditorium. Somebody said, "Where are you supposed to go?" This is the event. I said, "I have no idea." They said, "Do you have any idea how to get there?" No. I said, "No, I have no idea where I'm supposed to go." And that's because. My shepherd had abandoned me. <laughs> but I, I'm so engaged in conversation. I've been so engaged in this day. And what a privilege it is for me to uh, have seen every student in this school from a fourth grade uh, through 12th grade. And that's, that's just a, a tremendous treat for me. And also then to see, um, to work with the faculty about boys, which is a topic I like talking about. And then, 
in a masterpiece of creativity, Greg picked off my a list of speeches, a speech I almost never get asked to give at school. So I was just delighted. I was absolutely delighted. But I couldn't find the darn CD that I used to have to go with. So I'm going to have to tell uh, the story of that. So I don't have my um, uh, uh, AVA to it. You got a piece of paper, right? So, but uh, I need for this to be a little bit interactive. You saw what the title was. You came out probably because you already are worried about what I'm worried about. Yes? The title? You thought, I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm going to come. So I'm preaching to the choir. Okay? So let's have a little bit of fun. I want everybody for a moment to uh, just free associate and remember what I will describe as the sweetest moment of your childhood. The sweetest moment, whatever comes to mind, I say the sweetest moment of your childhood, take 10 seconds, just the sweetest moment of your childhood, first thing that comes to mind. Color. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got something? So how do you say color? You were how old? Um, I colored my whole childhood, I think. But it started probably when I was three or four. Right. But in your mind's eye, did you see yourself as a certain oh, yeah. color? Like first grade, I colored a clown that one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you were <a> competitive color. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a first. And uh, who was there? Uh, my mom. Okay. So she's part of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Somebody else. Sweetest memory. Please. Your um, first name. Claire. Yes. Running around outside, playing with my neighbor friends. Yes. Not having to be home at a certain time. I guess when we call and just the freedom and the safety to be able to do that in the Yeah. Claire. Thank you. Somebody else. Please. Your name. Mm -hmm. Amy. Uh, rock band. My dad liked the Rolling Stones and he was like the, the drummer in our band. And my brothers and I were the singers. You had a family so, band? A real for real band? Or you were playing rock band? Afternoon, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Just for day. <laughs> right. But it was playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So be honest. Sweetest moment of your child. Please. I'm one of six and we grass-fed all the time. Yes. And um, my sister and I, and my little brother, would load up the red wagon with dolls, teacups, toys, and go to the corner. Yeah. And have a picnic or a party, and just not a party. I mean, we just jump all our foot up there, playing our neighbors on there. They never care. And then load it back up and go home. Right. It was an adventure, but it, it was is great. All the way over to the neighbors. Long. <laughs> what? Tell me your name. Meg. 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 And, and in your mind's eye, when you had the memory, how old are you? Seven? Seven. Seven to eight. Okay. Three or four more. Please. Your name. Jeannie. Jeannie. Um, so just getting together with the neighborhood girls and doing the, the hands, you know, the, the scary neck and right. sailor and then making up our own and double dutch and just creating lots okay. of games. Do you, do you have a rhyme that goes with double dutch that you can still do, Jeannie? Um, probably, but I, I heard I don't want to test me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember any phrases of it? Um, I remember more of that. Oh, um, yeah. Um, anybody? Uh, uh, it's a majority of women here. Uh, uh, so, Eni, Mini, Cicilline, Du, Wa, Bapalini, Achi, Gachi, Liberace, I love you. Have a peach, have a plum, have a piece of plum. No peach, no plum. Just a piece of plum. Anybody? Does anybody else? Have you got it? Say, give us a couple of lines. Um, mine, no, but that one, uh, mine would be in Spanish and responding to what he said. So yes. it would be like, um, Zapatito Blanco, so kids go G have, give, yeah. yeah. Zapatito Blanco, Zapatito Azul, dime cuantos años tienes tú. Anybody?
anybody else? There is a purpose to this. Anybody else? Did did you have a a memory uh, of something? Yes, please. Your name. Angie. Yes, Angie. We, we just talked, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, when we get all the leaves together, and then we would make houses, so we would. Well, we and mines, and this is the bathroom, and this is the kitchen. Yes. You each had your own house, and you were in charge of it. Right, your own house. And Angie, were there any adults in your memory? Not playing with us. We were in my backyard, but no, like. Right. So there were a, there was an adult presence, a mom nearby. Yeah, in the house. And but not. No. Not present. No. And 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 God forbid, mm -hmm. no adult playing with you. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask your name? Taylor. Taylor, how old are you? Um, 12. 12. And you are? Laura. And? 14. Oh, 14. Um, did you have previous memories? Um, not necessarily like specifics, but like playing in the backyard with people mm -hmm. and things like that. Taylor, have you done a lot of that in your uh, childhood? Yeah, yeah. You both have. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> you give credit to somebody <laughs> But if you're in love, yes. and you drag them to a, a don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> I told them they would find it exciting. Yeah. Related to my career. If you warned them so. that I was going to call on them. <laughs> no. <to do something. laughs> we might get the business in the car. But. We see, I saw the two of you, and I thought, I'm in the process of trying to take adults back to have these kinds of memories, but I imagine you're closer to them. And so you, you two are my consultants. If I, if we hit a wrong note, if I'm talking about childhood and it goes playing for you, you think that's not so. I want you to say, no, 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 no. okay, would you, please? <laughs> you're my quality control command. Um, so. How many of you, when you had the sweetest memory of your childhood, had an adult in the memory? Okay, and the adult was? My grandfather and my mom. We were all together, we were in the kitchen, we ate together. Oh, nice. Baking together. Yeah. And somebody else you had a, an adult in? We were all playing like shoes out then. Shoes were rolling down the hill. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, it, it, my, I don't want to belabor the point, but when I started um, uh, becoming a, a parenting expert, whatever the heck is, that was, I was trained as a child psychologist, and then I found uh, myself working in schools, and I found I was doing more and more at answering questions of parents. And um, ask parents asking advice about what they should be doing, how they should be uh, managing their children's lives, and what was good for their children. And one of the ways that I was able to answer those questions was through research, but probably a more meaningful uh, way was trying to remember for me and people I loved and the patients I had seen in therapy what, what were their most precious memory. Did anybody in here have a memory of, of I did not ask for the sweetest time, but did anybody have a memory of playing on a town sports team? You did. Thank you. Tell me your name. Zach. Zach. You're how old, Zach? Four or five. You're what? You're four or five. Twenty-five. You answered for your age in the memory, and I asked that. You're four or five, and what do you play? Soccer. And uh, is it? It's. Is there an adult there? Um, the rap and the parents on the sidelines. Right, and you're playing uh, with your buddies and 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 playing soccer. Did you continue with soccer? Uh, my school. You did. So that was a sweet memory of something that did, in fact, was a sustaining part of your life. And, 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 and that was a, a, a sweet, sweet beginning. 
that is. Anybody else? One first. Remember time sports. And they're very early, but if I call it a pre-competitive level, would that be fair? <laughs> <laughs> or a pre-competitive um, level. Um, so, um, I'm worried about the loss of play in children's lives. David Elkind, um, who wrote a book, The Hurried Child, and wrote a book about childhood play, said um, there is a whole culture, a whole culture of childhood games, girlhood games, rhymes, uh, and songs that are dying out because they were never written down. But uh, you, in, you had, in, this was in Mexico, yes? Mm -hmm. That you learned this. Did you ever see the the, the double dutch rhyme that you gave us? Did you ever see that written down? Tell me, I didn't get your name. Um, was it Nigel by Josie? Uh, uh, Josie? Yeah. Did you ever see the rhyme you gave us? Did you ever see it written down? No. It, it was just basically, I don't even know where I remember it from, but like just. Made a from children and yes, you learned it from our children. It's actually a great oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And David Elkind says the great oral tradition of the, the double dutch and these rhymes and the things that you knew and the hand clapping and did you ever, Jeannie, see that written down anywhere? Never, never written, right? Never written because it's passed on from child to child. And David Elkind says, that is dying out. That that child-to-child -child transmission, oral transmission, transmission is virtually dead in Japan. The children have nothing to pass down to each other. Um, because there are so many organized and adult-centered activities that they are not learning. Uh, um, they're not learning those rhymes uh, 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 from, from one another. And those go deep. It's not that they don't exist in childhood. I, I uh, used to go to a, a private girls' school in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, at, at Chapin School, and I went there for 14 years to sort of do a life review with the seniors. And they were just trying to keep busy the last weeks of school. <laughs> and uh, they said they me, and I would ask them to go back into their girlhood and and I, we talked about second grade, and often they would burst into song. And the girls would all start, these 18-year-old girls from college bound would all start to sing a song that they had all sung together in second grade. So they're in there. Um, but very often the songs were written popular songs. The, the, they were songs that were a, a part of the pop culture. And, and what David Alpine is talking about is something different. And I am worried about the loss of the childhood experience of learning from older children and learning things that can only be handed down from older children. And all of the things that one learns in uh, the, 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 the sweetness of play. So, <clears throat> I'm 72 years old. Nostalgia is a constant temptation for old people and thinking it was better in the old days, right? Um, and I resisted it as best I can. I you know this afternoon, I was standing up. Was I not gentlemen for video games, right? Even though I didn't play them as a music because children love them, boys love them. And I don't believe in telling kids their play is bad. And I think if we're gonna understand children, you have to understand children's play. And if you're going to respect children, you have to respect the way they're playing. Um, and uh, so when people say, aren't you worried about video games? I say, no, and there was a piece in the New York Times last week. Uh, 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 media may not be the menace, you think, uh, of a study coming out of the University of California. Irvine that looked at a study that looked at 40 other studies and found that screen time is not causing depression and anxiety. 
Um, and it is causing uh, 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 some uh, issues in families and about time management, but it is, it is for adults too, right? Average American interacts with his or her phone on average 200 times a day. We, the average adult interacts with this. So when people tell me, aren't you worried about kids' use of these devices? I say, I'm worried about my use of this device. Are you kidding? Oh, completely bookless, right? But <clears throat> I'm ready to defend children's play. And, and I can't say that life was better if for one a, a generation of kids. Um, but it's impossible with that disclaimer. It's a kind of an arrogance to say, to compare uh, a generational cohort to declare one the best. Uh, that's, that's, it's, uh, it's, it's shoddy thinking. Um, I, do, I do have a worry about the loss of free play. And when I read that 90% of American children are involved in organized town sports, I have a worry. And you notice how gratified I was by Zach's memory that it was the pre-competitive. But then it was part of his life and his identity uh, uh, to play soccer. Who am I? Uh, who am I to gain say that? But organized play on a field with white lines and coaches and parents and sidelines is not the kind of play I'm talking about. I'm talking about a certain kind of spontaneous, uh, child-centered, child-generated uh, uh, free play. We know that play is, um, as one researcher calls it, the signature mammalian behavior. Signature mammalian insects don't play. Birds do elaborate mating dances, but as far as I know, do not play in the way I am talking about it. And turtles and amphibians and lots of animals do not play, but mammals play. The young mammals play. And can it have an evolutionary purpose? Well, I was lucky enough once to go uh, to work for schools in South Africa, and they paid me by um, arranging for me to go to a game park and uh, go on a safari. And I saw a lioness lying um, in the grass with her two cubs. And she was tired and she was lying down. Uh, but to entertain her cubs, she had her tail in the air and was flicking it back and forth. And her two cubs were jumping uh, at, at, at the tail, trying to pounce on her tail. She was doing no work. <laughs> but she was providing really high-level entertainment for her two cubs. And you can say, and it was obvious, that she was teaching them to hunt. But also, they were clearly having a ball. They were just having fun. And we can watch uh, the uh, young mammals um, have fun. When you put children together, the spontaneous activity children is play. That is what children do. That is what they are designed to do. And they do it because, as David Elkind says, play is the inborn disposition for learning, curiosity, imagination, and fantasy. We don't know what was in those lion cubs' minds, but for them, this tail, this flickering tail that the mother was, the enemy, the predator, the uh, when I take my retriever uh, out and throw the frisbee, well, I have a Labrador retriever, and I throw the frisbee for her, and I was just doing it with my granddaughters. Um, they're actually seven and five. They can throw the frisbee better than I can. Uh, and they were very interested in why my dog barks just as she grabbed the frisbee, just before she grabs the frisbee, she barks, and they said, well, well, 
you know, Papa, why does she bark? And I said, well, I think she thinks it's her prey, or she, it's, it's, it's the summation of something, I've got it, boom. I, I, is that play, is that hunting, is it both? Is there dog imagination in it? I, I don't know, it's just that I know that my granddaughters were appreciating a dog's play as, as play wanted to uh, uh, understand it. What, what children package into play is, um, well, all of their best stuff. <clears throat> and children make friends. Um, and I write about this a lot in my book, Best Friends vs. Enemy. Children make friends. Hey, do you know when children can make, or first make friends? This is a developmental quiz. When can a child first make a friend? What do you have to do to be able to make friends? It's four. Uh huh. Way late. Way, way late. Way late. When can a child make friends? What do you have to be able to do? Two? Why do you say two? It's what? You can, you can engage in reciprocal play. It's actually uh, as soon as you can crawl around nine months because children in daycare centers, as soon as they can crawl. Look, before you can crawl, you're trapped on your mother's lap. And you can you, you see babies on their mother's lap and they're gazing into this other baby thinking, oh my God, what a fabulous baby. You want to get with that baby, but they, you can't get anywhere because you're on your mother's lap. But as soon as you can uh, be, uh, as soon as you can crawl in daycare centers, they film babies and they make deliberate choices. Uh, they cannot do fully reciprocal play yet, as that you clearly knew about the parallel play and reciprocal play, but, um, but they will hand each other more saliva covered objects and uh, they smile more uh, at one another and their mood is better. The moment they're with another child, they're developing some sort of interaction. And even if at nine months or 10 months or 12 months it's not sustainable, you can already see them creating play <clears throat> between them in a way that no adult could guide them to or uh, 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 think of for them. We're quite pinned down to the kind of toys we buy them and, and the way they're supposed to play. But that's not the way children play. Children play <coughs> in spontaneous and imaginative ways. And they can use anything to play. The poorest children in the world in the most desperately poor village can find things uh, 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 to play with. And while their situations may in fact make those of us who live in the first world sad because we understand the implications of poverty, <laughs> the capacity of children, even in desperate circumstances, to create play is to me uh, 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 quite remarkable. So as adults, we want to say this is all educational for them. And uh, my dear colleague and friend, Ed Hallowell, uh, said one day, he said, man, he's a wonderful child psychiatrist who's written about ADHD, driven to distraction and answers to distraction. And when you worry about the child you love and the childhood roots of adult happiness, a book I recommend to all of you, Childhood Roots of Adult Happiness. Is that a nice title? <laughs> yeah? Childhood Roots of Adult Happiness. Ned said to me one day, I hate it when people describe play as the work of childhood. Right? Because they turn something imaginative and beautiful into a respectable work thing that adults can then protect because it's work. And uh, he, he said, um, uh, you know, play is actually the play of child. It is what it is. And what it is nourishes the brain and nourishes, I mean, literally, when children are playing, 
there's a greater blood supply to the, uh, the brain. It's also true when they're at recess, which is why I believe in two recesses a day, but don't get me started on that. <laughs> um, uh, what? <laughs> I, I believe. Uh, yeah. Um, I commend to you a book by also another colleague and friend, John Ray, R A P E Y. The book is called Spark The New Science of Exercise in the Brain. Okay? He recommends one, at minimum, one extended period of intense exercise in every school. And he would say that, it, uh, that both of uh, the, the physical activity, the, the effect on the physiology of the body, and its impact on the brain. But if John Brady uh, Spark, you can probably get him on um, uh, uh, YouTube. Anyway, <clears throat> I had clipped for a while, and I'm going to have to describe to you, because as I said, I don't often get asked to give this talk. And I just couldn't uh, find out where the old CD is, and I hadn't transferred it um, to the thumb drive that has the PowerPoints for all my talks that I never use. Because uh, I like looking people in the face and talking, and I hate it when they're all looking over my shoulder. Um, and uh, it was actually a marketing CD from a school in Hillsborough, California, called the Nueva School. Uh, and the Nueva School, um, uh, uh, outside of, uh, in a, a very distant suburb of Los Angeles, is a school for gifted children. Gifted children, whatever, gifted children. Uh, that's a swamp, we're not going there. <laughs> um, but the fact that the parents sent their child to a, a, a school for gifted children um, gives Nueva enormous latitude by saying these kids are so bright, they're going to learn we can provide them with all kinds of experiences. And in this video, they had, um, a, a, they, they filmed for prospective family, the Nueva Forts. Nueva is a school that has, uh, is on at the top of a hill, and down the hillside is an old forest, and actually an olive grove. And they have two recesses a day, for these gifted children. And they let them go for very long periods of time into a forest where buildings and grounds have not cleaned up and put into a chipper the branches, the fall of the trees. They've been saved for year to year, year after year after year in a very dry climate. And there are tons of um, branches that have fallen off the tree, all safe and dry. And at the beginning of every year, kids are allowed to go down uh, into this forest twice a day and build forts using the branches uh, to construct their things. And there are only two rules. There are only two rules in the way of forts. Um, you can't steal branches from somebody else's fort. Okay? And you can't monopolize all the branches. You have to uh, share the branches, but kids start building forts. How many people have memories of childhood of building forts, if not outside? Right now, are those memories coming back to you? Building forts? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? And constructing a uh, fort. How many also, uh, in unseasonable weather, uh, how many built uh, indoor forts with blankets in the back of a couch and stuff like that, the way my, my kids did in winters in Massachusetts. And they could take over a whole, we built a whole, right, a whole uh, blanket forts everywhere, which were uh, 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 very precious. Um, and my son Will uh, had a very, a little girl, uh, a daughter of a family friend, uh, Casey, and Casey and her family moved away um, from Arlington, Massachusetts, back to the husband's home <coughs> in Tennessee, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we have followed them down and had our Thanksgivings in Chattanooga. But Casey and a third girl who was also a child of family friends, um, when they were uh, yeah, 17 or 18, 17 or 18, um, 
they built a fort in the living room as a tribute to what they built when they were little children. They just, I don't know how it came to them. And it, but it was, you know, made us all want to cry because it was uh, essentially a, a, a memorial uh, to the games of their childhood. Does everybody here have a warm feeling about building forts? Yes, you do. So Nueva says, we have forts and we let children play. And when you watch the CD, they have they hired a professional camera crew. And they, the camera crew just follows kids uh, setting up forts and listens in on the conversation. And they're all questions about design, and let's do this, it's got to be like that, and the room is here, right, like the leaves. And no, that's not this, no, this is the kitchen, that'll be that. And the kids are talking, negotiating designing, talking, negotiating, designing constantly, and the camera people are um, just silent observers. And then all of a sudden, um, some seven, eight-year-old girls are collecting pebbles from the ground, and they're creating a currency. And some of the pebbles are shiny, and some are less shiny, and they assign values to the shiny, more shiny pebbles. And um, I watched this film and I am just transported because this is a school that is allowing enough recess, like a 40 minute period. I, there's no same school that would allow this twice a day, right? Ever, ever. But this is because they're gifted, right? <laughs> right? Isn't that because they're going to learn the academic stuff so fast, the girls so bright? And, but I used to show the, the film because the filmmakers, um, the filmmakers just follow the kids and they, they just, you just watch the kids play. And the kids are clearly getting on what's called the play plateau, where th there's a shared imagination, there's a shared fantasy, and um, they're just into it. They're in the flow. Well, Mike uh, Michaela Chiksmahali, he was a uh, Chiksmahai, uh, an unspellable uh, name, uh, was a professor at the University of Chicago and came up with the idea of flow for you. Do you know the concept of flow? When you're an adult and you're an absorbed task and t it suddenly becomes timeless and you're not aware of anything, you're just in the flow of it. And as a writer, I sometimes get that, oh my God, it's the best. <laughs> um, and you're, you're one with the material, you're moving forward, and um, you're in the flow. And uh, for adults, this is so, so sweet, and frankly, kind of rare, right? Because <laughs> our lives are filled with things to do and obligations and minutia and stuff, uh, to, to be in the free flow of anything. But Chiks Mahai writes very movingly about it in a book called Flow, about what, why we search for that. But of course, children don't have to search for that. They find it. They find it. And if you leave children alone to play, they will get into the flow of it. Taylor, you know what I'm talking about? <coughs> and it's, oh, look, uh, I've dropped. Lauren, I, I, I knew it was an L name. Uh, do you, do you, can you just, do you know what I'm talking about with flow in play? Can you remember the last time that happened uh, for either of you? Is it something you're already outgrowing as, as school gets more serious and you get older? So you can get into a flow in writing. It's pretty delicious, isn't it? Yeah, we all love that. We, we, but, but can you remember it in play, or is that already now at 14 a distant memory? I don't remember. Right. It's hard. It's very ephemeral, isn't it? Um, so what, what we know is that, uh, wait a minute, I showed the, the uh, flip for a reason. Because at a certain point, the educators at Nueva all start talking about children's play and how important it is to develop social connections and how they're learning uh, uh, moral rules 
and they're solving conflicts. And when I saw this wonderful CD the first time with this watching children's play, so I'm transpired. When the adults started talking about the play as educational, I wanted to scream, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Just let them play. Don't talk it to death. But of course, Noe was trying to explain what it did, and it had a right to do it. And but my reaction was sort of um, adults talking about children's play can't begin to capture uh, the, uh, 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 the beauty of it. But here, here for Nueva, that they allowed, I've checked with educators at Nueva, and they still do it. And they, they'll have two long recesses a day, and the kids go for it. And I remember uh, uh, a boy climbing up a branch that he had lodged into sort of the, uh, a Y shaped crotch of a tree, and he climbed up the a uh, branch and standing up there, uh, crowing like a rooster, um, and I thought, risk management. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to the long serving head of Nueva, I said, so what do you do with your insurance people? Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, we have a playground. We always take them to the playground. <laughs> we show them playground equipment, we show them soft, you know, bouncy stuff. We don't show them. We don't take them down into the woods. And so we show them, uh, we have a regulation playground. And that made me laugh. That's risk taking that, sadly, no public school can engage in. And most independent schools don't have the courage to. But the way it does. And it, the film raises for me the question of how is it possible, uh, given our educational goals, and um, and our fears for children. How how do we uh, how are we going to be able to let them play? There are all kinds of cultural threats to play. Um, how many people here, when you were growing up, walked or biked to school? Raise your hand. How many of you now allow your children to walk or bike to school? That's a larger percentage, but it may be 10% of you, 15%, more than 50% of you walk your bike to school. Um, and tend to, uh, now you have the brilliant mother, were you allowed to walk or bike to school? Was it too far? Too far, so you were carpooling. Take the bus, a public bus or a school bus? School bus, okay. It's not the same, is it? And there's no play quite on a school bus, although kids always try. <laughs> but too much play, you get drunk on the bus drive, right? And, and for my school, Belmont Hill, which is the old boys' uh, advanced school where I work, um, because parents are so afraid of bullying on the bus that we have cameras. Did you have cameras on your bus? Yeah, you did have cameras on your bus. We had cameras on your bus. So you can only go back and look at videotapes. That has an impact, huh? Um, I don't know about you, but I, I Walking to school was the best time of my childhood. I was raised in New York City. Um, I was born in 1947. 1957, I turned 10, and like every child my age in New York, I got a bus in some way. And I took two public buses. I took the Lexington Avenue. I walked down to Lexington Avenue and took the Lexington Avenue bus down to 79th, and then um, across to the west side on the 79th Street cross town bus. And walked uh, two blocks to collegiate school for boys. Um, my mother was a wildly, wildly anxious woman. Everything made her nervous. Um, but she couldn't say no to this because everybody was doing it. And I did it, and my mother learned that I was capable of getting myself to school and back on the public buses of New York at 10. And the sweetest memories I have of, of being a boy in New York are walking alone in New York. And the same feeling as that boy had had in the way before us, of climbing up the branch. I had that feeling. I'm, I'm alone. Actually, I'm the king. I'm king of New York. And no one can contradict me. Because here I am. And nobody knows that I'm king. I'm just king. <laughs> right? 
I am on my own in New York. Um, children walk into school, play games, and sing songs. Did you walk to school? Yes. You did? Mm -hmm. Is that where you learned that doesn't last? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. See, that's the walking to school. So, four years ago, 80% of American school children walked their bike to school, and that's down to 13%. And your mother may love you, but driving in the car with her is not the same <laughs> as walking with your friends and teaching each other rhymes um, and games. Um, what? Um, I grew up in this small town, Nemo, talking to the same morning. Right. Uh, With many people, many people in the neighborhood. Yeah. And we now have a, what's called a, a loss of social capital. There's a wonderful uh, sad book called Bowling Alone about the death. The title comes from the loss of bowling leagues all across the United States. The neighbors who used to bowl together. We now have one television. We don't know our neighbors. And the more uh, well to do a neighborhood, the lonelier people are. You build a, a bigger house and a bigger property. and you, you're less likely to know your neighbors or, or walk to school. I live in a, uh, a neighborhood which is at the bottom of a, uh, 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 one road. It comes down, it's a dead end road, and there are 25 houses. It's a, it's, a, it's a perfect place for kids. And there's a very, very good public school. I went a less than half a mile walk uh, with lights, I mean, sidewalks and crossing, and no children in my neighborhood walk to school. They're all driven. They're all driven. Um, but the loss of that social capital of neighborhood and knowing your neighbors is um, a, a part of the problem. The other is time. And then there are irrational fears and need for control. Um, uh, this is uh, comes about because the modern parent is, according to William David at Stanford, the, the modern parent is parenting with trauma theory in mind. Um, we know much more about what is traumatic and the revelations about child sexual abuse, also uh, uh, what happens for soldiers coming back um, from the battlefield. I mean, we did not know that. We knew something that happened to World War I veterans, we call it shell shock. But of course, many of them were suffering from PTSD, we now know it. And we know children uh, were abused or children who have seen violence domestic violence themselves may be traumatized. William Damon um, says that the modern American parent is parenting with trauma theory in the back of her or his mind all the time. And we see our role as preventing our children from being traumatized. How can you argue with that? Nobody wants their children traumatized. But then there, what will traumatize a child then becomes a a uh, 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 source of sort of subjective speculation. Could this be traumatic for my child? I better protect her from that. Could this be traumatic? Could something traumatic happen? I better. So I had a mother came to me and said, Dr. Trump said, I know I should let my children walk to school. I just can't. And I said, well, I hear the self-reproach. What? Why are you saying you should let them walk to school? And she said, it's only three blocks. And I said, how old are your children? And she said, 11, 9, and 8. And I thought, yes, you could. <laughs> you, you could let your 11, 9, and 8-year-olds walk to school, right? But what's the right age? I was up in Littleton, New Hampshire with my daughter, Joanna. And we picked her children up at Lakeway Elementary School. We're driving back to her house about a mile. And we pass the middle schoolers walking uh, towards my daughter's, the neighborhood she now lives in. My daughter said to her, uh, seven and five year old daughters, she said, and that's what you'll be doing in middle school, right? You'll be walking. Because it'll be, in fact, the middle school less than a mile from their house. So she's starting to say to them, you will be walking to school. And I, of course, was pleased because those two middle schoolers walking along the street have some freedom and independence. And even if they weren't, in fact, 
complain, they would be conversing in a way that was private. Um, our fears that our children could be snatched from the street are, I understand the fears. I'm a parent and a grandparent. I've experienced every fear there is have, and they're terrible. But you can, of course, protect your child to the point of where you just make them wild and angry because your fears are contagious. And as a parent, and there's some fears you have to control. Uh, has anybody uh, ever been in Tokyo on the school board? Anybody been in Tokyo on the school board? Uh, the Tokyo public schools require Japanese parents uh, to allow their children to walk to school starting in first grade. Public schools in Japan want children to walk to school first grade. So when you're in Tokyo, and I've been in Tokyo a number of times uh, for the American school in Japan, I've never been in a, in a, a Japanese uh, 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 public school, but I have seen this astonishing sight of six-year-olds walking everywhere, all with their little Hello Kitty backpack. <laughs> and the reaction of an American to this is, oh my god, where are the parents? Where are the parents? <laughs> and then I've also been in the Tokyo subway and seen six-year-old Japanese kids get on the subways and go uh, a couple of stops at their school. I knew that totally freaks you out because it's so un-American. But the thing you learn by watching is that six-year-olds actually can get themselves to school. What we understand children to be developmentally capable of is shaped very much by what we, uh, by our own cultural expectation. And we don't think six-year-olds can do that, but the Japanese do. And then people say, well, Japanese culture is much safer. It is. It's more communitarian of uh, uh, culture. But um, the big threats to free play are global competition, academic ambition and homework, the rise of organized sports. I have at a school, which is a huge athletic powerhouse, and the boys in my school love their sport. Therefore, they come to Belmont Hill because of course, I am not against. I am not against organized sport. I've seen what it can do for boys. I can see what it did for my daughter, who is a gifted athlete, not my genetic, I'm not. My daughter, my daughter and my son are adopted, but my daughter played 12 seasons of varsity sports. Uh, I was captain of two teams. I will never speak against organized sports. But it's not free play. It's really not free play. And um, the rise of organized sports does crowd other things out. So, um, at Belmont Hill, I have to talk about this at the upper school today. We take uh, the senior class up to a camp in New Hampshire. It's the early days of September, still warm. And we go up to a summer camp, so we go up in, in, in the town of Freedom, New Hampshire, Camp Cody. And we have 80 guys, and many of our guys are really very big because they're athletes and they, they come to play a serious sport, and we do this team building thing with a bunch of exercises. And we also give them a free swim period. And we also give them uh, a couple of hours uh, to just play their own games. Now what's interesting is that many of these, many of these boys are varsity athletes. And, uh, but in different sports. And they almost never have a chance to play together. And we let them go down to the water <coughs> to swim. And it always causes some anxiety for the adults because they go way far out. They go way, way out. And I'm standing there thinking, I can't rescue these kids. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, well, wait, wait, wait a second. Out of eight kids in the class, there may be 15, 18 in our camp counselors with Red Cross Lansing. They're in a much better position to save each other than any of the faculty standing on the shore are let them go. But the feeling of let them go, can we trust them? Oh yes, oh yes, actually we can. And when we ask the boys when they come back from this day and a half retreat at Camp Cody, we always ask them, what did you like the best? Did you like the exercise as a psychologist? Did you like the secret letter from your parents? 
um, uh, the Actual Treasury Provision, which we adopted. Um, and we, there's so many elements that we've stolen to make this a, a wonderful team building began discussion of leadership and all the, what do they say is the best time? The free, time. the free swim and the free play. And they write, we never get to play with each other like this. We play on teams together, but we never get to play with each other like this because we're not involved. And there's no refs, no rules. Okay, so those are the things against it. What are the signs that free play, the loss of free play, that the main thing is obesity. I do not for a minute think that um, coming home, changing your clothes, going to town soccer, 20 minute drive to the field, staying there, listening to your coach talk to you for 20 minutes, then playing and getting back in the car compares for the amount of exercise you used to get in free and directed play in the neighborhood. Do you have memories of just running, 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 running constantly? I think the running involved in free play is actually more than most town sports, with all due respect. As I say, my daughter played a ton of that. I've had on the hat of a parent, proud of his daughter and her engagement with town sports. But I, I, I think free play is, 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 is uh, we are having an outbreak of stress and anxiety. That's what I was talking to the upper school today about stress and anxiety. Increased ADHD, which could, which could be restlessness and lack of, of play. We know, uh, how many of you have ever read Richard Lube? I bet I can't be good you. you know, I've, uh, I've got three folks who read our camp up here come because of my uh, book about camping homes and happy. You've all read Richard Lou, it's the last child in the moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a that's a bio, one of the Bibles of the camp book. Richard Lou, the L O U B, the last child in the woods. I've never read his second book. Is it as good? It is, it is. Have you read? Mm -hmm. Alright. Richard Lou, the last child in the woods. And he's talking about this generation of children being separated from nature. Um, but I'm worried about the social incompetence of the boys who come to us. I can illustrate it with a story. George Tahan is our director of athletics at Belmont Golf. And he was a very, very good ice hockey player, grew up in the Finger Lakes uh, of, of upstate New York, and then went on to play uh, Division I college hockey. Um, he became a lawyer for his sins and missed hockey so much he came to the school and said, I'm leaving the law, you got a job for me. And he was our uh, 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 assistant business manager for a while, <coughs> hockey coach, and then he became our athletic director. And can I tell you that in modern independent school, having an AD who's a lawyer is a very good thing. <laughs> very, very, <laughs> right? Uh, you wouldn't advertise a job that way, but it turned out. <laughs> so George told me that one time uh, a new eighth grade boy at Belmont Hill called and we start our winter sports season immediately after Thanksgiving on our ice hockey teams uh, uh, start up. And then there's that huge two week break. And then I have to come back and play games right after the Christmas break. But it's a two week break. And the eighth grade boy said, uh, Mr. Tan, wait, will there be ice time for Belmont Hill boys? Uh, over vacation, and uh, our athletic director said, of course they will. And the boy said, but I, I, I don't mean you skate in circles, I, I mean, you know, get pucks and sticks. And he said, of course there will be. Then, of course there will be pucks and sticks. And, uh, and the boy said, and, and, and will there be gold? And George said, well, I don't know. Uh, you, you might have to call him. You might have to get called. And the eighth grade boy stood there, stunned. And he said, well, could you call him? So here's a boy who's been playing hockey probably since he was six years old. He's now 14. Quite a credible hockey player, but he's never actually organized a game of hockey. And George told me this story was so poignant for him because his life in the Finger Lakes of New York was organizing games on lakes outside and going through trying to find enough guys play the game and find some goalie, <laughs> right? Um, but
But here was a boy who probably played a ton of hockey, but never actually organized a, a team.